Lawrence Woodcraft raised two daughters inside Scientology. Now Lawrence, Zoe, and Astra have left the group, and Astra has a daughter of her own. Recently, they visited the Lisa McPherson Trust to share their stories. Astra spoke to Stacy Brooks about Scientology's impact on their family and the dramatic step she took to escape from Scientology. This is Kate Woodcraft. Kate, you want to say hi to the camera? Say hi, hi to everybody. Astra, why don't you tell us the story of Kate? Um, I have been in the Sea Org for about four years at this point, and I was 19, and um, I hadn't been happy the whole time, um, but I'd never really admitted it. Um, and then um, my dad's mother died, and I was able to get um, a week off to go to her funeral in England. So I spent some time with my family. I hadn't seen my family in England for 10 years. I spent some time with my dad. I hadn't been able to spend a lot of time with him for the whole time I was in the Sea Org. And it just dawned on me that I could not, I couldn't take it anymore. I wanted to be able to see my family. I knew I'd never ever be able to go back to England and see my family again. And I knew I would not hardly be able to see my dad because I had already been told I wasn't allowed to see him other than this trip. But I had never said, you know, I want to leave. I had never said I'm not happy because if you want to leave, it takes like a year, six months to a year. You, you have to do hard labor, you have to wear like gross clothes and you're put under watch, someone's watching you the whole time, and you're called, they call you a degraded being. What does that mean? That means you're like a criminal, like a bad person, like scumbag, and the staff refer to you that way. The commanding officer, Ron Norton, would regularly go up to the staff who wanted to leave and say, are you still a degraded being? And they'd have to say yes if they still wanted to leave. Mm. So every single staff member is going to sneer at you, look down on you. It's like, it's just a horrible feeling. And then you're trapped for six months because, I mean, people would say, why can't you just walk away? But I have my mom, I have my brother, and I have my sister and my grandma in the Sierg. If I just walked away, they'd never, ever speak to me again. And I couldn't take that at that point, you know? So it was partly that I couldn't stand the idea of like six months to a year of hard labor, but it was more that I knew they would just change my mind back because that's what regularly happened. That's what one of my jobs was, to change people's minds back who wanted to leave. But how did you do that? Well, you know, it's just like duress, like you're out ethics, which like means you do like bad things, you've done bad things, you've done criminal things, what are you hiding? You know, and you're forced to admit, you know, thoughts you've had, bad thoughts you've had, things you've done. You get to the point where you know, you you just you would rather just stay there than just you know have people looking at you like that, calling you things like that, harassment on a daily basis, being under watch. You know, it's like it's like the difference between if you were in a minimal security prison where you have some freedom, and then you're going to be sent to the high security prison. You know, and you just say, okay, I'll stay, but I'll just go back to the minimal security prison because at least you know you know, I'm treated like somewhat of a person as opposed to... So that's what it's like and it was my job to do that at one point and I knew they'd be able to break me because I wanted to leave so bad and my resolve was really strong but so were a lot of people's and I knew they'd break me, you know, over and over and over and I just, I thought I'm gonna have to do something where then I just have to go, there's no choice and the rule was, okay, first you were allowed to have kids, then when I went in the, into the organization, you got sent away to lower org. About a year before I decided to leave, they made a new rule, and that rule was, if you get pregnant, you get an abortion. If you won't get an abortion, you're out. And you're out, and they give you a, a big bill. So you lose your job altogether. You lose your job you altogether. Yeah, yeah, and um, you're still considered a, a degraded being and all of that, but they just kick you out. First, they very strongly try and coerce you to get an abortion, and I know several people who did, which I can go over in a bit. But um, so I thought, and I wanted children too, and I had been married since the age of 15, and I hated being married. My husband and I didn't get along at all. 
we could not talk about it because I couldn't the main reason was I didn't want to be there and I could never tell him and it was just ridiculous you know being married at 15 I'd known him for three months I didn't know him you know so I didn't want to be married but I had the impression that I would never want to be married again because this is what marriage is like but I did want children so I thought I'll have a baby they'll let me go I'll have a baby, you know, without having to get married again, because I never want to get married again, which is not true now. That's how I felt then. Um, and I thought, that way I'll get pregnant. If I refuse to have an abortion, if they can't break me on that, which I knew they couldn't once I was pregnant, then they won't be able to do anything other than let me go. And I won't have my husband come with me because I don't want to be married to him, and I didn't really think he wanted to be married to me anyway. And at that point, I wanted to leave so badly, but I felt like I was a bad person. So I felt that I shouldn't make him come out, too, because mm. that would be even worse. Up to after I left, I still felt it's my fault. I've been a bad person. I've done things wrong. I can't, you know, confront my crimes, but I have to leave because I can't stand it. Because um, that's the whole, like, thing in Scientology is if anything goes wrong, if you get sick, if you break something, it's your fault. You know, you've done something wrong. It's never... Um, it's never like someone else's fault. Mm -hmm. So that's what I thought. So um, this was in October of 97. And in about, <laughs> in about um, December, end of December, early January, I got pregnant. And um, then, but I didn't tell anybody. And I was very sick. I had really bad morning sickness. I couldn't eat. I was throwing up about 20 times a day, but throwing up nothing because I wasn't eating, just, you know, going through the motions. But I would just, I'd be working, and I'd run downstairs to the bathroom and do it really quietly so no one knew me, and no one knew. And I still was, I was so terrified to leave, but I decided because I was so sick and I was so tired that I was just going to take off. I was going to get on a plane and go stay with my family in England for a little while while I, like, got better, and then I would come back. I, I planned on following their policies on leaving because if I just took off and didn't come back they would declare me a suppressive person which means that my mom, my sister, my grandma, my whole family would never speak to me again. I didn't want that to happen. At that point I was planning on still being a Scientologist, being a good Scientologist and all of that. You just, didn't just want wanted to, be, to leave. Yeah, 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 in the Sea Organization. Yeah, I just couldn't take it anymore. So my plan was to go to England for a little while, then come back and do their process of leaving, and then leave. So that's what I did in uh, the end of February. One day I, I got a day off because no one knew what was going on. I had been awarded, you know, one of the best staff member awards, and you know they thought I was great. You know they thought I was a really good staff member. Everything was wonderful. And one day I took the day off, and I went and saw my dad. And they had told me I can't go see him, but I went and saw him anyway. And then the next morning, I had, um, I had already packed all my clothes in my car, and I just went to the airport. And um, I went and checked my baggage, and as I was walking through the uh, security thing, where, you, where they check your check on baggage, my brother walks up. My brother's in the Sea Org. And he goes, hi, Astra. And he was with a security guard from, from where I worked. You're kidding. I'm not kidding. What this did was you do? okay. It freaked me out, but I had half expected it because I used to have to do that. Oh. I used to be sent to the airport to get people who were taking off. But I was very surprised that they knew exactly what terminal I was going to be in yeah. and everything. And um, so he says, "Hi, Astra," and I said, "Hi, Matthew," and I walked straight into the bathroom. And I figured I will just sit in the bathroom till my flight is boarding. And I walked straight from the bathroom to get on my flight. So I did. I sat in the bathroom. Um, he sent a little girl in to, to tell me to come out. And I said, thank you. And I stayed in there. Then, after everyone had left the bathroom, he came into the bathroom. And I wouldn't open the stall. And he climbed over and started talking to me. You're kidding. And he, I, So finally I said, okay, I'll come out. Cause what anything, was he saying to you? He was saying, I have mom on the phone. Mom wants to talk to you. I was terrified of anyone talking me out of going. I knew they'd be able to. My, I was... I was sick. I hadn't eaten for like weeks. I mean, not to keep anything down. I was exhausted. I was like on the verge of a mental breakdown if I hadn't already had one. She's asleep. So, um, 
I knew, you know, they just have to say a couple words, and I was feeling guilty. I was wanting to leave, but I was feeling so guilty that what I was doing was so bad. I had written notes to people saying, you know, crying, saying, this is all my fault, I'm a horrible person, I've done wrong, but I have to go. You'd left notes for people? Yeah, for, for my dad and for my, for my husband. I didn't want to talk to anybody. Mm. I had, like, this much resolve left to get on that plane. Mm. So I said, okay, I'll come out. So I just stayed in there for like another 10 minutes, and then my plane was boarding, because I knew what time, it, I figured, you know, 20 or 30 minutes before it took off, it'd be boarding. So I walked straight from the bathroom, and I, oh, I had written a note to my brother, and this was the first time anyone knew I was pregnant, and I had said, I'm pregnant, I'm going to see my cousin, I'll come back. And mm -hmm. I gave him that note, and I kept walking. You and mean the, you gave him that note in the bathroom? Well, I came out of the bathroom at that point, and I gave him the note. So you didn't even want to talk to him? No, I, <laughs> I did not want to talk to him. So, um, and I started walking, and then the security guard, whose name is Mike Valiente, um, started saying to me, you know, we can work it out, you know, the, the, the typical lines, we can work it out, let's, have, let's just sit down and talk, let's calm down, blah, blah, blah. I just ignored him. I, I said, read the note I just gave my brother, and I kept walking. I was waiting in line to board. And my brother was standing there with me, and I was crying. I started crying. People were looking at me, and I said, "I'm just going to cool down, to to you know, to get to get better, and I will come back. I won't get declared a suppressive person. I'll come back." And my brother says to me, "You're not being a Sea Org member." Obviously, not the brightest thing to say to me at that point. And I said, "Well, I'm not going to be anymore." And he's like, "You need to speak to mom. She's on the phone. She feels really bad." Well, I know how my mom is, and she's not going to be saying, oh, Astrid's going to be okay. She's going to be saying, you know, you need to go back, you know, because she's very, a very fanatical Sea Org member. So, um, so I was just trying to ignore him, and um, I got my boarding pass, and then I was waiting in line to board. I had my passport on my ticket in my hand. Luckily, I was holding on tightly because my brother got desperate and tried to yank them out oh of my hand gosh. and make a run for it so that I couldn't leave. <laughs> I was holding on tightly, and he, you know, it was like a little back and forth, and he let go. What were the other people I doing? I snatched it, but I don't know. I mean, I was crying. I was a mess, so I knew people were looking at me, but I didn't really know. And I mean, I should have, I would have called security, other than the fact that, one, he's my brother, and two, you know, I thought I'd get declared a suppressed person if I did that, because if you report anyone to the authorities... Right. So I was trying to keep it cool, but I'm like, oh my god, he's trying to take my ticket and my passport. So I said, I can't believe you did that, and I just got on the plane. Then a stewardess comes up to me with a note from my brother yeah. saying, when you land, call your mother, you know? Because he'd been saying to me, she's on the phone, I have her on the phone, you have to speak to her, you have to speak to her. So I'm just crying, I'm a total mess. Um, I got on, you know, I'm on but the plane. But you got on the plane. And it took <laughs> off, and I was like, oh my god. Incredible. So my plan when I landed, I had maybe 25 or $30 was going to change it to English money and catch a bus to my aunt's house. I didn't even know. <laughs> I knew their address. That was about it. I thought I didn't. I had no plan. I had you know thirty dollars in my pocket after the ticket because I spent all my money on the ticket. And um, but what I didn't know, what I found out after is um, obviously at that point they knew where I was going. I was going to England. Um, my mom was trying to get, was arranging with where I worked with the security department to get people from the organization in England, security, to meet me at the airport, which I knew it was, that was going to happen because that was what happens. If you can't stop them getting on the plane, you have someone, because they have organizations everywhere, meet them at the airport and send them back or, you know, whatever they're going to do at that point. So I figured that was going to happen. That was what I was expecting. But what had actually happened was my dad had said, if you have people at the airport, she is going to flip out. I'll have my sister meet her, then, then you know, because he was trying oh. to do what was best for me. So um, I expected them to be at the airport. So I got off the plane, I changed my clothes, and I put my hair up, and I threw away my umbrella, because I thought they'd say she had an umbrella with it because it was pouring during that time. And... Um, you know, so I thought I looked totally different, so no one would recognize me. Because the people in England didn't know me. They'd only recognize, you know, they'd give a description of what I was wearing. So then after all of this, I finally walk out, and there's my aunt and uncle, and I was so happy. Because they have nothing to do with Scientology. They don't like it at all. And I was so happy, but they had been waiting for like an hour, because I was doing all this stuff, oh. getting myself all disguised. So um, I was just so happy. I was like, oh, my God, because I was tired. I was sick, and they were just going to... And then I could just go to their house. They were going to take me. 
So then we went to the house and then I called my dad and then I called my mom and my mom instantly started off crying saying, you know, you, you need to come back, you need to stay in the Sea Org. Um, the main thing she did was she used my sister. Zoe didn't even want to be there, but I didn't know that. And she was saying, Zoe's plan is to come to L.A. and be in the Sea Org with you. And, you know, what, what am I going to tell her? What am I going to tell her? What should I tell her? And she's saying, you should get an abortion. I know how it is to have a child when you're young. It's too Your much Your mother was telling you this? My mother was the main person who was like, you have to get an abortion. Because... Um, I, I then ended up speaking to like the authorities in the Sea Org, but I said to them, because once mentioned abortion, and he said, L. Ron Hubbard says, I said, L. Ron Hubbard says abortion isn't okay, and he said, L. Ron Hubbard says it is okay because he says um, the spirit doesn't enter the body until right before birth. So if you have an abortion before that, and I knew that, that was like the line going round. If you have an abortion before, you know, when, you know, when the baby's only a few months old or a few weeks, it doesn't affect anyone, it's just like killing an animal because uh, the spirit's not there so it doesn't matter.